What a powerful name it is. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for the power of your name. Thank you that you are mighty and great and holy and good, that you're perfect, that you're loving and kind and gracious. What a powerful name you have. We thank you that we get to come together in that name, that we get to come and pray in the power of that name, that we get to live lives by the power of that name. God, we're here to thank you today. We're here to lift you up and praise you and worship you and say you are worthy and you are good and we are so grateful that you've made us your children, that you've made us your people, that you've invited us to join you in your mission to save this world. Thank you, God. Thank you for that powerful name that we live by. Thank you for that name, that, that reality of who Jesus is that can transform our lives. God, we come today in need of transformation. We come today in need of being made new and made whole. And we thank you because you're the only one who can. We love you, Lord. We thank you for the opportunity to worship together today, to fellowship together today, to open our doors and our arms and our hearts to the community, to invite them in. Lord, we ask that you would draw them here, even now, people that are wondering whether they should come, people that don't know what to do, people that walk by on the street or drive by in their cars, God, that you would draw them in, that we would be able to share your love with them, that today they would get to meet Jesus Christ. We ask for that in Jesus' name, that powerful name. Amen. 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 You can be seated. Good morning, NHU. If you are a guest with us today, welcome. Thank you for joining us. We're so happy to have guests joining us today. And I just know, because I know people, and I know people would rather go to lunch than go to church, that we're going to have twice as many people eating lunch with us, and I'm excited about that. I'm all right if the first time somebody meets me is over a lunch instead of in a worship service because it gives us that opportunity to reach out, to love, to share. And so there's more coming for the neighborhood, and we're looking forward to just an awesome day celebrating today. And we're here today as a church, NHU. We are here today to love our guests, to serve our community, to welcome them. And if you're with us today and you're not typically with us, I just want to invite you. You're always welcome to be here Saturday mornings. We come together at 1030 and we don't always throw a huge party in the parking lot, but we always have an opportunity to love and to be loved and to grow and to know more of Jesus. And so I want to invite you to join us each week. You know, it's November. We're having this Harvest Festival. We're getting ready for Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving is this awesome holiday. It's a lot of fun. It's a lot of food. It's an opportunity to be grateful and thankful for everything we have. But you know what they say about Thanksgiving? Thanksgiving is all about getting your entire dysfunctional family under the same roof and hoping the police don't get called. And if you've actually had to call the police on Thanksgiving, I'm sorry. That was insensitive. I'm available for counseling if you need it. And of course, Thanksgiving is traumatic, actually, for some people because of their family. For others, it's traumatic because of their football team. Because every year, we know that on Thanksgiving, one of these will be slaughtered, and the other is a turkey. So sorry, Ray, and all you uh, Cowboy fans. It's, a it's actually not quite that bad. The Cowboys, believe it or not, are 29-18-1 on Thanksgiving Day games. But it's fun to think about those 18 losses, right? So th there's, the, the, there's the family and the food and the football, and we fall asleep in this turkey-induced coma, and then we wake up the next day for Black Friday. Black Friday is awesome because only in America will people trample others for sales exactly one day after being thankful for what they already have. I didn't know if you'd laugh about that because I might be hitting a little too close to home. As you can tell, uh, if you didn't know this already, I'm a fan of stupid jokes about Thanksgiving. In fact, that's what pastors love best about Thanksgiving is they get an excuse to tell a bunch of dumb jokes. Which brings me to maybe my all-time favorite Thanksgiving joke. The children would appreciate this. Unfortunately, they're all in class, but why do pilgrims' pants always fall down? Because they wear their belts on their hats. So at this point, if you're one of our guests, if you see one of our guests headed to the restroom, it, they're not really going to the restroom. The truth is they're leaving. They're running to their cars. They might be back for lunch, so they don't have to hear any more of these jokes. But before you leave, let me give you two commitments. Number one, that's the last stupid joke I have planned this morning. 
I might tell more stupid jokes on accident, but not on purpose. And then the rest of the message and the lunch and the fun we're going to have afterward are going to make up for the dumb jokes. So now that I've embarrassed myself, I'm going to give you guys a chance to embarrass yourselves. I'm going to ask you to do something. And if you attend here regularly, you know that I'm not the kind of preacher that asks you to do stuff. Like I'm not, you know, turn to your neighbor and say this. But I'm going to do that today. So in just a moment, I want you to turn to the person next to you. If you don't have somebody right next to you, turn around, look for somebody. Don't be lazy. Don't be too good for this. It won't take long. But I want you to turn to the person next to you and complain about something. I want you to grumble about something. I want you to say something negative. Oh, not yet, not yet, not yet. I know some of you are really like, yes, I didn't know I'd get to do this at church, but give me a second to get some directions. It can be something bad that happened today, something where you wish you had, something you wish was different in your life. It could be a disappointing relationship. It could be a pain you're dealing with. It could be having to listen to my jokes, anything, anything negative. You ready? All right, go for it. Look at the person next to you, say something negative. If you really want to go for it, you can say something negative to the person on either side. Really negative. I mean, intensely bad. Come on, Yunnan. They're right there. Okay. All right, you've had your chance to vent. If it takes you longer than 10 seconds, you're getting way too into it. Now I want you to do something very different. Now I want you to do something different. Now, and again, wait until, wait until I say go, but I want you to think of something that you're thankful for. It can be something good that happened today. It could be something you're thankful that you have, something you're glad that it is just the way it is. It could be a loving relationship or health or even that you love my jokes. I mean, anything positive, anything good. You ready? So now turn to the person next to you, turn to the person on either side, say something positive. Say something you're thankful for. Express gratitude for something. If you don't participate, you don't get lunch afterward, okay? So make sure that everybody's involved. All right. <laughs> All right. If you were paying attention, if you were really able to be sensitive to how you were feeling and what was going on inside of you when you did those two things, you might have noticed something very different about when you're complaining and hearing complaints versus when you are grateful and, and sharing gratitude. Doctors are, are studying and understanding the brain more and more, and they're coming to these incredible discoveries about what happens inside of our brain when we do these two different things. Believe it or not, when you were complaining, even if for that moment it kind of felt good to get to vent a little bit, when you were complaining, it actually made your life a little worse. It made your brain a little more tired, a little more depressed, made your outlook on life a little more bleak. And the opposite is true. When you were expressing gratitude, it actually, just saying those words out loud made your life a little bit better. It made your brain a little more energized, a little happier. It made your outlook on life a little brighter. And now if you really want to see the difference, you might not notice it in just 10 seconds of each. But if you really want to notice the difference, go a few hours where you don't say anything positive, where everything is a complaint, grumbling, saying something that's bad, saying something negative. And then go a few hours where you never say anything negative. All you say is positive things. All you say is things you're thankful for. You really want to push it, go a whole day of doing one of each. Of course, if you do that, be careful. Uh, if you do that negativity thing for a whole day, you might lose your marriage or your job or something else really important. But you might be surprised on the day that you only say positive things about what you're grateful for. How much happier you are after a day of doing that. How much you actually enjoy the job that you've been telling everyone you hate. How much better you get along with your spouse that you've been telling everybody is a terrible wife or a terrible husband. How much better you get along with your parents or your siblings. How much more you appreciate them. How much more satisfied you are with the possessions that you have. See, we tend to believe that if we had everything we wanted and got everything we earned and things went the way they're supposed to, that that would make us happy. But the reality is, it's not happy people who are thankful. It is thankful people who are happy. It's not happy people who are thankful, it's thankful people who are happy. Are you waiting around to be happy before you're thankful? 
Are you waiting until you get life exactly the way you want it before you express gratitude? Are you telling yourself that being happy will make you thankful? Most of us are, if we're honest. Most of us, that's how we think. So we go, we go through life very ungrateful. We go through life very unthankful. We go through life complaining and criticizing, depressed and disappointed, always wishing things were a little different, a little more, so we could have this or do this or go there or know these people so we could be happy. And if we could just be happy, then we'd be thankful. And little do we realize it doesn't even work that way. See, we think that it works like this. Number one, you get what you want. Number two, that makes you happy. And number three, then you can be thankful. But the truth is, the reality is, it works the opposite of that. Number one is to be thankful, which produces happiness, which gives you a whole different perspective on what you have and what you really want. There's this really challenging verse in the Bible. It's in a little letter with a very long, funny name. Of course, the letters in the New Testament are, are named after the cities where they were sent, to the churches in those cities. So this letter went to a little city called Thessalonica. And the Apostle Paul wrote this letter, and at the end of it, he kind of throws this laundry list of things at the Thessalonican Christians to let them know this is how you live life. This is how you live a full, abundant, eternal life with Christ. And this is one of the things he says to them. 1 Thessalonians 5.18 says, In everything give thanks, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. In everything? What about when my kids get sick, when I lose my job, when my car breaks down, when my wife and I have a fight, when I flunk the test, when I can't pay the rent, when I'm lonely, when I'm scared, when the world just seems to be going crazy around me? In everything give thanks? Like, are you kidding me, Paul? Sometimes I read this verse and I, I feel like this guy. Yeah, if you could stop telling me to be grateful, that'd be great. Sorry, I know I promised no more planned jokes. I'm pretty sure that's the last one. But sometimes being told to be grateful, being told to give thanks, is just one more thing to complain about, right? Like, I can't believe the preacher told me I have to give thanks. Like, how unrealistic is it of God to expect me to be thankful in the midst of everything? Why would God put such a heavy burden on me? How can he expect that? How can that be his will for me? It says this is God's will in Christ Jesus. Isn't that unfair? Isn't that asking like way too much? But what if I told you that the reason God wants us to be thankful in everything isn't to require something of us, but to give something to us? Like what if being grateful in everything was a gift God was giving us? A gift that would change our lives, a, a gift that would allow us to have peace and hope and joy in the midst of everything? What if it wasn't a burden but a way of taking a burden away from us? What if it wasn't work, but rest? What if we really, and this is the key question, what if we really believed that God's will for us was what was best for us? As we read a verse like this that says it's God's will that we're thankful in everything, and we think, oh man, God must really not understand what my life is like, or he wouldn't want that. What if we really believe that God created us, that he made us, that he knows what will make our lives good and what will make them bad? You know, when people make cars and, and they, they write that little uh, manual, you know that little booklet that goes in your glove box that you never look at that tells you how to take care of your car? When, when they write that booklet, that little manual, if you look in there, it tells you what kind of gas to use and what kind of oil to use and what kind of brake fluid and transmission fluid to use, all this stuff. It tells you how to care for your car, how, how, you know, how the tires should be inflated and everything. Like, it tells you how to take care of your car. Now, when they give you that booklet, are they just trying to give you a bunch of busy work? Are they just giving you chores? Are they putting a burden on you to say, all right, you've got this car, and, and you could run it any way you want. You could put whatever in it. You could do whatever you want with it. But just for fun, I'm going to make you do all of these other things with it. That's ridiculous. Like, they give you the manual to tell you this is how your car is going to actually work. This is how it's going to run the way it's supposed to run. This is how it's going to be in good repair and how it's going to last for a long time, get you where you need to go. When God gives us these things in Scripture that tell us His will for us, 
He's not telling us some extra burden that he wants to put on us. He's not telling us something just arbitrary. He's telling us, I made you, and this is how your life can be everything it's supposed to be. And so when he says, it's my will that you be thankful in everything, that's because he knows that is what gives us a life worth living, a life that's full, a life that's happy, a life that runs right. What if God's will for us is a good thing? You know, I recently read a book that's made a huge impact on me. It's called Soul Keeping by a pastor named John Ortberg. And this book is all about the, the inside part of us, our, our souls, and how to keep our souls healthy. And one of the chapters, Ortberg talks about the fact that the soul needs gratitude. That the soul needs gratitude. And we're tempted to think that you know, if we just made more money, or had better friends, or got to have more exciting experiences, or got more of the stuff we wanted, that we'd be more thankful. But Ortberg writes, more gratitude will not come from acquiring more things or experiences, but from more of an awareness of God's presence and goodness. In other words, it, it's not our, our circumstances, and it's not a change in our circumstances that brings about more gratitude. It's not the way that things change around us that makes us more thankful. It's a change in our perspective. It's a change in how we think about what's going on. It's been said that gratitude turns what we have into enough. Gratitude turns what we have into enough. There's an old saying, show me a person who's not thankful for what they have, and I'll show you a person who won't be thankful for what they get. Show me a person who's not thankful for what they have, and I'll show you a person who won't be thankful for what they get. And it's interesting because we've actually all experienced this, right? Like you've had those times when your perspective shifted and you thought about what you had to be thankful for, but it wasn't because you got more. In fact, most of us realize how much we have to be thankful for when we lose something, not when we gain something. That's crazy, right? Like somebody gets sick and they become more thankful for health. Somebody loses their home in a flood and they become more thankful for their family. Somebody has a huge crisis in their marriage and it makes them more thankful for their spouse. Like we go around telling ourselves, oh, if I just got a little bit more, if I just got something better, then I'd be thankful. But the reality is it's not the change in the circumstance, it's the change in the perspective. It's not getting more that makes us more grateful. It's having our perspective changed about what we already have. It's about being grateful for what is good in our lives. I want to introduce you to a word that maybe you've never noticed before. It's, it's not a word that we use by itself in English, but we put it on the front of a lot of other words. And the word is bene. Bene, it's from an old Latin word. It means good. Now, because we have a lot of people who speak Spanish, there is a word in Spanish that comes from the same Latin root that is used by itself. What's that word? Bien or bueno. So two different words in Spanish, at least two, that come from the same root, and they're used by themselves, and they mean good. But in English, we don't use this to mean good by itself. We just put it on the front of words. And there's, there's four words that start with this that I want us to be thinking about today as we think about gratitude that I think is going to revolutionize the way that we give thanks. And the first word that we use all the time is bene fits. See that word there at the beginning? Benefits. These are the good things in life. And I want you to think right now, just for a few moments, what are some of the good things in your life? I, ju I just want you to take a moment, just sit right where you are, and just think of three things, one from each category. I'm going to give you three categories. Just think of one thing from each of them. The first category is a possession that you have that many people in the world don't have. So if you have clean water, if you have a house, certainly if you have a car, if you have internet access, th think of these, th these things, and they're probably things that you can't remember the last time you were thankful for them until the day you didn't have them. <laughs> but the things you just use every day that many, if not most people in the world don't have, think of one of those things a good thing in your life, a possession you have that many people in the world don't have. Now think of one person that you love that loves you back. One person that you love and they love you. 
the good thing in life. And now think of one reason that you have for living. Just one reason you have, one purpose, something in your life that has meaning and value that makes you want to wake up and live every day. You know, if we had time this morning, we could sit here and with a, a group this size, you could each list five things, take a little more time, list ten things, take a little time, list a hundred things. If you had time, each of you could list a thousand things just from these categories. Good things. You know, sometimes we get down and we get frustrated and we get disappointed and we think our life doesn't have much good in it. The problem isn't that our lives don't have much good. The problem is that we're so focused on the bad and on the things that we don't have that we lose sight of the things that we do have. The crazy thing is that if we're not grateful for what we have, the things we have actually become sources of ingratitude for us. Here's what I mean by that. So the first category I asked you to think about was possessions, things that you have that many people in the world don't, things you just take for granted, clean water, food, clothing, housing, transportation. So here's what happens. When we're not thankful for these things, good things in our lives, things we need to live and to thrive and to grow. And when we're not thankful, when we're not conscious about saying thank you and thinking thoughts of gratitude about those things, when we take them for granted, when we don't realize that they're a gift, then we have this thing inside of us, this greed and this jealousy and this envy and this materialism that gets going and it's fed by this culture of advertising that's always telling us that we need more, so we need to buy more and to buy more, we need to make more. And after we make more, we need to spend more. So instead of gratitude for these things, they actually become the basis for ingratitude and feeling like we don't have enough or don't have enough to be content or happy. So it's no longer enough to have clean water. Now we have to have like designer water. Like, can you believe the money people spend on water so that it will come in a glass container with a logo on it? Like that, it's mind boggling to me. Or, or food. It's not enough. It's never enough that we have way more food than we need, way more variety than we need, way more access than we need. No, we need that food to be faster, or we need it to be more extravagant, or we even need it to be prepackaged and put together and served to us like we're kings and queens. And they better do it right or they're not getting a tip. Sorry, former waiter in the house. The, the bitterness is coming out. But do you see like how it works? Like, we have food. That's a gift. Like, that's something to be thankful for. But because we're not thankful for it, it just becomes this appetite. Well, we gotta have better food. We gotta have more food. We gotta have different food. I'm sick of this food. I'm tired of that food. We gotta go out. We gotta do this. We gotta do that. Because we're not grateful for the food we have, and so it becomes a source of ingratitude. It's the same with clothing. Oh my goodness. Like if you travel the world a little bit and you see the clothes that people piece together just to try to cover themselves from the elements, like how ludicrous it becomes, the obsession we have with buying brand new clothes and designer clothes and fashionable clothes. And, and not just, it's not just the consuming of it. It's what's going on inside of our heads and hearts when we're doing it. I, I need that new pair of shoes. I need that 15th purse. I need that style of shirt. I have to have it because all my friends have it and all the people on TV have it and I don't feel good about myself when I don't look the way that they look. This is what ingratitude does to us when we don't say thank you for the things that we have. It's the same with housing. It's not enough that, that like half the world's population is living in some shanty and we all live in these nice insulated homes with electricity and running water and all of this stuff. Like, no, we need another room. We need the man cave. We need better decorations and bigger televisions. And we, we have to have the twin vanities in the master bedroom because it's impossible for a husband and wife to use the same sink to get ready in the morning. I mean, that's unthinkable. Like, what are we, cave people? We have to have marble countertops. Can you imagine preparing your food on linoleum like it's 1940? Like we think this way because we're not thankful for the things we already have. And it's, it's everything. It's the cars and it's, it, it's the very things that we can be so thankful for. 
end up being used against us. We use them against ourselves, and our culture uses them against us as reasons not to be thankful, not to be satisfied, not to be happy. In the middle of the Bible is the Bible's biggest book, a book called Psalms. It's this ancient song book that includes 150 songs written by King David and a number of other people. And a lot of these songs, something I love about this book, a lot of these songs are songs of thanksgiving. They're just somebody sitting down and saying, I'm just going to write about how thankful I am for everything that God's done. And I love this because of the example that it sets for us to be intentional about verbalizing and recognizing and listing the good things that we have in life, the benefits. One of those songs of gratitude is Psalm 103. It starts out like this. Praise the Lord, my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion, who satisfies your desires with good things. See, when it comes to gratitude, our emotions follow our actions. It's not that if we were, if we got more stuff, then we'd be happier and then we'd be thankful. It's if we would give thanks, it would create joy. It would give us a whole different perspective on what we have. When we're reminded to be grateful, we often think, that means I need to feel grateful, and I just don't feel grateful. Israel, you're up there, and you're, you're telling me I should give thanks, and you're telling me I should give thanks in everything, and you're telling me that I should be grateful, but I just don't feel grateful inside. I got a lot of problems. I got a lot of things that aren't going right in my life. I got a lot of things I want that I don't have, and it's, it's not fair, and I don't feel grateful. And we try to feel grateful. Maybe you walk out of here today and you say, well, I feel guilty because he showed me these Bible verses that tell me to be thankful and I'm not feeling thankful, so let me try to feel thankful. But you don't change your feelings just by wanting to. We have a hard time changing our emotional state, controlling the way we feel. But what King David, when he wrote these Psalms and what so many have come to understand is that when we begin talking about what we're thankful for, when we begin expressing it out loud, when we say, I'm thankful for this, these are the benefits in my life, what happens is our emotions catch up with our actions. Right now, you might not think you have a lot of good things in your life. You might not see a world just abounding with benefit. The idea, uh, the idea of feeling thankful right now might seem difficult, maybe even impossible. But there's this incredible power just in listing the good things in your life and saying thank you for them. So in 2010, a man named John Kralik re, uh, released a book called The Simple Act of Gratitude. Uh, Kralik was a guy, his life had kind of become a disaster. He was, he was miserable, he was broke, he was overweight. He had just gone through his second divorce. He's living in this nasty apartment in L.A., no air conditioning. He's kind of in, you know, just, he's a mess. He was actually an attorney, but he couldn't afford to pay his employees. Things weren't going well in his law practice. He was just... He was messed up. He was on the brink of bankruptcy, both financially and just personally. So one day he goes off on a hike out in the hills around L.A. It was actually a New Year's Day, and, and John Kralik had this kind of epiphany, just this moment. He had an idea. He thought, i got to try something different. And the idea he had was that he was going to write a thank you note. New Year's Day, he said, all right, this year I'm going to write a thank you note every day for the next year. By the end of this year, I'll have written 365 thank you notes and sent them to people. He decided he wanted to find a reason to be thankful and grateful every day. So he started writing them, just one note, just one note every day for a year. And that, that year of just saying thank you to one person one time a day produced this incredible change in his life, produced this book that he was able to release writing about how the thank you notes taught him to value the good things that he had in life, to create a discipline of focusing on the positive things. And it's incredible the impact of the book. After the book was released, he continues year after year to receive hundreds, even sometimes thousands of thank you notes from people who've read his, his book, and it changed their life. Praise the Lord, O oh my soul. Don't forget his benefits. See, if we're not intentional about remembering the benefits, it's very easy to forget them. And there's a benefit that we've received that is greater than any other benefit in life. In another of Paul's letters, this one to the church in Rome, he says this, He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? 
Paul says that God has already given us his son. Because God has already given us what mattered most to him, the very best that he had to offer. Like, why would he hold back giving anything to us? And what does it mean for God to give us his son? Why did God need to give us a son? I don't know if you've noticed this, but you've got issues. You've got issues. (laughs) We've all got issues. We're jealous, we're envious, we're dishonest, we're rude, and we're selfish, we're sexually immoral, and we're greedy, and we're violent, and we're angry, and we're addicted, and we're broken. I mean, humanity is a hot mess. If you don't believe me, I mean, turn on the news. Go to a playground and watch a group of little kids. Or just take a moment and be honest with yourself about those hidden motivations and desires that you have. Those thoughts. And, you know, a lot of us want to get better. We realize we're broken. We realize we're a hot mess. We want to change. We want to be loving and patient and kind and joyful, but we don't know how and we can't seem to change ourselves. We try and try, but there's this thing that kind of is inside of us, kind of controlling us and making us sad and angry and lonely and dissatisfied and disconnected and searching for hope, love, and meaning. And we live in this world full of disease and death and heartbreak and sorrow and violence and war and natural disasters, and it's just this brokenness inside of us and this brokenness around us. This is what the Bible calls sin. And sin is something we do, and that's what we usually think of. Sin is this list of bad things that we might do, but it's also this power that controls us, that enslaves us. And sin produces death in every way. It's going to kill us physically. It's well on its way. I mean, so far, it's, it's got this 100% track record of killing us. And it's killed us spiritually. It's cut us off from God. And the best thing in this life is that God hasn't forgotten about us. When you think about all the benefits that we have in this world, God hasn't forgotten about us. He hasn't left us to die alone in our sins. God has come to earth in the form of a man named Jesus. And Jesus lived this perfect life. And he died a violent death, but he rose from the dead. And he showed us what it was to overcome sin and death. And if we trust him, and if we believe in him, if we accept his forgiveness and his love, and we follow his teachings and receive his help, we overcome sin and death. And as Christians, that's what we call the good news, the gospel. God has given us his very best to save us from our very worst. The best thing in life, the the greatest benefit you could receive is Jesus. He died to take the pain and the punishment of our sins. He experienced death for us so we could experience real and eternal life with him. And so my, my greatest hope for every person in this room is that when you walk out of here today, Jesus will be the number one benefit that you think about, the number one thing on your list. He's our only hope for forgiveness, for freedom, for real life. And when we receive him, we can trust that God is going to also graciously give us everything we need to live the life he intends for us. Which brings us to this next good word, the next bene word. Benefactor. Benefactor. This is a giver of good things. A giver of good things. Now, we know that word bene, it's good. What about factor? Does that make you think of a factory? A benefactor, this is somebody who manufactures, who makes good things. And if you get serious about listing all the good things you've received, you'll discover it's this huge list. Somebody has been working hard to fill your life with good things. It's going to make you very grateful. Like this woman who started the project 365 Grateful back in 2008. She was feeling depressed. She was feeling down despite all the good things in her life. She had what appeared from the outside a great life. Good family, lots of money, all this stuff. But she just felt down. She felt messed up. And so she decided every year I'll take a picture of one thing I'm grateful for, post it online, tell a story about it. You can check out that website. It's pretty cool, 365grateful.com. You can see years now of stories that she's telling with these pictures. But if you begin to be grateful, if you begin to say thank you, you'll discover that someone is responsible for the good things in your life. So when you say thank you, there's the thank part of it, that's the gratitude, but then there's the you part of it. There's somebody there who's accountable. 
And while we might receive a million good things from the people around us, the greatest thank you belongs to God. We owe him thanks because of his love for us. Because of his love for us. There's this incredible story about Prince Edward of England. Uh, you know, because unlike us Americans, the Brits still have monarchs. We, we got rid of that back in the 1700s. History joke, I know. There's no audience for that. But Prince Edward of England, back in 1934, he made a visit to a hospital. This was after World War I, and, and this hospital was treating soldiers from World War I. And there were 36 men that had just been terribly disfigured, terribly messed up from fighting. So he goes to visit these 36 men, and he goes bed by bed, and he, he kind of kneels down next to them and takes their hand and thanks them for their service, thanks them for their sacrifice. And he gets done, and the doctors are about to show him out, and he says, hold on, I've been counting the beds. I've only stopped at 29 beds. You said there's 36 patients here. And they said, yeah, but there's, you know, the other seven, they're they're so terribly disfigured, they're so injured, they're so messed up, we we keep them separate because it's just too much to deal with. And Prince Edward says, I want to see those men. So, of course, he's the prince, they have to do what he says, so they, they take him in, and he starts going bed by bed, and these guys, I mean, their, their faces are destroyed, and they're missing limbs, and they're, you know, and he goes to each of them, and he kneels down, and he says, thank you, and he expresses his gratitude on behalf of a grateful nation, and he gets done, and they get ready to push him out the door again, he says, wait a minute, that was only six, that, like, I can add, guys, where are you hiding, there's one more soldier, and they said, you your majesty, we can't show this guy to you. Like he is, He's kept in a room by himself in the dark. That, like The doctors and nurses can't even look at him. He's so messed up, and he's just laying there just waiting to die. Nobody sees that guy. And Prince Edward insisted, and so they took him in, and when he saw this man laying there, he goes down on his knees, and he actually took this guy's disfigured, distorted, messed up face, what was left of it, And he kissed him on the face, and he thanked him for his service. And this incredibly humble act, this king coming in and finding this disfigured, broken person and showing them love and showing them compassion, this became this huge news story in England, and they couldn't believe how awesome their prince was. But what God has done for us is so much greater than that. Because that prince, he was going to find these soldiers who had sacrificed. He had gone to find these soldiers who... They had done something good. He owed them a debt for his freedom. They had fought to keep him free from Germany. But what our God, what our king did, he didn't come to earth and and show us compassion and show us mercy and show us love because of something good we did. We were his enemies. We were his rebellious children. We were running from him. We didn't want anything to do with him. He came and did that for us just because he loves us, just because he's good. He did this because we're his creation. See, without God, there's nobody else to thank. Think about that. For all the people you might say thank you to, without God, there's nobody to thank. There's nothing to be thankful for. God created us. We exist because of him. Without God, there is nothing to be thankful for. He created everything. And that's why in the letter that the Apostle James wrote, he said this, Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. See, without God, we wouldn't exist. Every good and perfect gift comes from our Father in heaven. We wouldn't have food and water, heat and clothing, hope and love, friendships and laughter, cars and smartphones, homes and families. None of that would exist. Every good thing in our life, if you were to write all the benefits, it all comes from the same benefactor. Every time we say thank you to anyone for anything, that thank you also belongs to God because he is the good, good father and we are his blessed children. You know, our expressions of gratitude, if we really get into a habit and into a lifestyle of saying thank you, of listing our benefits, that's going to have the greatest effect. They're going to have the most transformational effect on our lives for the better when we're offering that thanks to God. Yeah, you should say thank you to people, but every time you thank a person, thank God. Paul says, actually in the beginning of his letter to Rome, he says that this turning point where people turned away from God in rebellion, where they got turned over to these 
delusions and to these perversions and this, this mind that was completely against God and, and got caught up in all of the violence and all of the strife and all of the hatred and the, the immorality and all this stuff. Paul says the turning point is that they didn't recognize God for who he was and they didn't give him thanks. They didn't acknowledge the existence of God and they didn't thank him for who he was. That was the first step in humanity turning away from God. And we live in a world trying desperately to forget about God. We live in a culture trying desperately to create its own morality and its own meaning without God, and it doesn't work. We have good things. We have benefits because we have a giver of good things, a benefactor. And that makes us beneficiaries. A beneficiary is a receiver of good gifts. A receiver of good gifts. There's this incredible story about a man named Scott McCauley. In September of 1985, Macaulay writes, when I was 24, my folks decided to get divorced. I was taught that to be a good son, I needed to be supportive and loving to each parent and to my siblings, but nobody was talking to anybody. If you were nice to one parent, the other one would get mad at you. So when October came, I thought, what's going to happen at Thanksgiving? And I just did not like the thought of being home alone or anywhere alone on Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving is not about gifts or fireworks or hoopla. It's a meal around a table where you give thanks for the blessings you have, and you really can't do that by yourself and have much fun. So I decided to put an ad in the local paper, Macaulay writes. He says, if people thought they would find themselves alone, this is the ad he put in the paper, if you thought you'd find yourself alone, give me a call and I'll make you a Thanksgiving dinner. That first year, a few people came and they had a good time. I was nervous about making a mess out of the food and disappointing people, but the food was okay and I didn't burn anything. I've held the dinner every year since, every year since 1985. Last Thanksgiving, he said, 84 people showed up. Sometimes they're new to town, sometimes they're recently divorced or widowed. I've had people who were new to the country and didn't speak English, but they enjoyed my Thanksgiving dinner. I've had poor people, people who came from AA, old people. Also not counted within that number, I always feed the police. The firefighters and EMTs are in buildings with kitchens and can have their own Thanksgiving dinner, but the police officers are in their cars driving around town. Two years ago, a woman with Parkinson's disease came. She'd been in a nursing home for seven years and had never been out. Somebody told her about the dinner, and she hired an ambulance to bring her at a rate of $200 a mile. She had a great time, and she cried when the ambulance returned to get her. Most of the people who come don't know who I am, Scott writes. They know there's some skinny guy in the kitchen, but they don't know my name. I think the theme of my life and everything I do could be summed up with the name of an old hymn called Brighten the Corner Where You Are. I hope my legacy will be that I came into the world, I brightened the corner, and then I quietly left the world unnoticed. See, Scott McCauley is a man who understands that he is a beneficiary, that he has received good things, and because of that, he can become a benefactor. He can give good things to others. And look at the effect that it's had on him and on dozens and dozens of lonely people on Thanksgiving. He could, have, he could have been bitter and angry and disappointed about his parents' divorce and just lived in that for the rest of his life. Instead, he realized how much he had and how much he had to give. See, gratitude is one of those incredible things that the more you give it away, the more it multiplies, the more you receive. That's why Jesus said, freely you receive, freely give. And a lot of us, when we hear of someone being a benefactor, we think of God maybe being our benefactor. We think of ourselves as beneficiaries, but we think, I couldn't be a benefactor. A benefactor, that's somebody with millions of dollars who can give it away. But that's not what makes someone a benefactor. What makes them a benefactor is when they share what they have. In his letter to the church in Corinth, Paul wrote this. Every, for who, sorry, 1 Corinthians 4, 7. For who makes you different from anyone else? What do you have that you did not receive? And if you did receive it, why do you boast as though you did not? Everything we have in life is given to us. That's not a very popular thing to say, is it? See, we live in a culture that believes that hard work and independence and earning your way and getting what you deserve, that what you have is what you've earned. and It's yours. Paul says, everything you have was given to you. Everything. There's nothing you have that you didn't receive. It's crazy how these people go around thinking they earned everything they have. They don't remember the fact that they had a God who gave them existence, a mother who carried them for nine months when she could have legally killed them. They had parents and relatives and friends 
in some cases a government that took care of them when they were helpless babies and children, feeding them and changing them and teaching them to talk and eat and wipe their bottoms. That as they grew up, people educated and trained them and kept them safe and gave them opportunities to work and learn. That they were given the ability to achieve, to work, to learn, to succeed because they were healthy enough, strong enough, smart enough, all good things that they couldn't give themselves. Of course, they only existed in the first place and they had life because of what God had done for them. What do you have that you haven't been given, Paul asks? The answer is nothing. No matter how hard you've worked, how much you think you've earned, how independent you want to feel, the truth is that everything we have in this life is a gift. And it could disappear far faster and far easier than it came. You know, the idea that we're entitled to all the goodness in our lives is actually one of the biggest obstacles to gratitude. Ortberg writes this, the more you think you're entitled to, the less you will be grateful for. The more you think you're entitled to, the less you'll be grateful for. If you think you deserve something, you're not likely to say thank you for it. When you realize that everything you have is a gift, that's when you begin to express gratitude. And it's expressing gratitude that's important. Not just because feelings of gratitude follow the words of gratitude, but because feelings of gratitude that aren't expressed are a huge waste. The author William Arthur Ward said it this way, feeling gratitude and not expressing it is like wrapping a present and not giving it. The novelist Gertrude Stein said it this way, silent gratitude isn't very much good to anyone. So express your gratitude. You don't have to worry about it running out. Gratitude, it's been said, is a currency that we can mint for ourselves and spend without fear of bankruptcy. And that brings us to our final good word, practicing gratitude. Benediction. Bene, diction, good words. Good words. You know, if we've heard this word benediction before, we've probably heard it in a church context. This is the prayer at the end of the service that the old guy stands up and says. But it means good words. It, words are such powerful things. I'm working with uh, couples, and I work with couples all the time, married couples, and couples going through crisis and pre-marriage counseling. And one of the main things we talk about is the power of words, how these, this husband and wife, they can say things to each other that's either going to build their marriage or destroy their marriage, that the words that they say have power. Words are powerful things. When we speak about what is good in our lives, our jobs, our relationships, our families, that's a powerful thing. And I don't mean some spooky, stupid thing like you'll hear sometimes, oh, just speak it into existence. Just say what you want and that's going to appear. That's not what I'm talking about. And I'm not talking about pretending that everything in your life is okay. I'm talking about focusing on the positive, saying the truth about what is good to bless others and to shape your view of reality. Philippians 4.8, Paul says, Brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, Whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. But don't just think about them. Talk about them. Say them. I want to invite the worship team to come up as we finish. We become more grateful by speaking words of gratitude. We become more grateful by speaking words of gratitude. Many of you have heard of Zig Ziglar. How many that name's familiar to you? Zig Ziglar. He lived from 1926 to 2012. He was an author, a salesman, a motivational speaker. He was known for being positive, for encouraging people to be happy and grateful. He's probably best known for this phrase, an attitude of gratitude. And honestly, when I hear a phrase like that, I think it's pretty cliche. I think it's pretty trite. I tend to be pretty skeptical, like, you know, the person who came up with that probably didn't have much problems. But Zig Ziglar had all the problems he could hope for. He was born dirt poor. His dad died when he was six. His mother was left to raise 11 children by herself. The family was basically penniless. Ziegler grew up in this family, eventually made a life, and got married to a woman named Jean. They had four children, Susan, Cindy, Julie, and Tom. Susan got cancer as a little kid. And I have a child who's gone through cancer treatment who survived Susie went through cancer treatment and she died. Zig Ziglar wasn't a man who floated through life on easy street. He was a man who discovered that saying thank you, that looking at the positive things in his life would transform him, would change his life no matter what came his way.
an anonymous author has wrote, written, be thankful that you don't already have everything you desire. If you did, what would there be to look forward to? Be thankful when you don't know something, for it gives you the opportunity to learn. Be thankful for the difficult times. During those times, you grow. Be thankful for your limitations. They give you opportunities for improvement. Be thankful for each new challenge which will build your strength and character. Be thankful for your mistakes. They will teach you valuable lessons. Be thankful when you're tired and weary because it means you've given your all. Gratitude can turn a negative into a positive. Find a way to be thankful for your troubles and they can become your blessings. Or in the words of St. Paul, in everything give thanks for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Paul doesn't say in everything feel thankful. He says in everything, give thanks. Speak the words. Speak the words. Experience the benefits of gratitude. Psychology is finally catching up with the Bible. Look at the benefits of gratitude that modern psychology has found. It opens the door to more relationships. It improves physical health, improves psychological health, enhances empathy and reduces aggression, improves sleep, improves self-esteem, increases mental strength. This, when God says be thankful in everything, he's giving us a gift. He's telling us this is how you live a good life. We receive benefits from God. Our life is full of good things. So take the time to list them. Take the time to thank God for those things. Tell people thank you. Tell God thank you every day. We have a benefactor. God has given us every good thing. Let's take the time to thank him, to intentionally out loud, to say thank you, God for these relationships. Thank you, God, for these things. Thank you, God, for this provision. Thank you, God, for salvation. We are the beneficiaries. We are the ones who've received. So let's live a grateful life, a life that says thank you, a life that gives benefits to others. God has been so good to us. We have so much to be thankful for. Let's live a life of gratitude.